welcome everybody uh, in this uh, Friday afternoon. Uh, we are welcoming Aaron Muli as our uh, as our panelist for today's session. Uh, he is an experienced trainer and um, HR development expert from the United States. Uh, he had his uh, bachelor from Dartmouth College and uh, a GD from the University of Iowa uh, College of Law. And now he is uh, sitting right now in Budapest and uh, he will give us a short introduction into the lawyer skills for a crazy world. That's our title today. So just let it begin. Enjoy the session and uh, don't forget this. That's uh, it's an interactive one, so you can you can ask questions and uh, and yeah, Aaron will 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 start soon. So yeah, have fun. All right, thanks a lot, Christoph, and uh, thanks to Benedek and all of the your other colleagues with RS Boney. Like uh, it's really cool you guys put on these events for your colleagues, and I, I think uh, it sounds like it's been going great. So I really appreciate you bringing me in. Uh, as Christoph mentioned, uh, once upon a time, uh, I was a lawyer back in Chicago. And when Benedict came to me with this idea, you know, to tell you guys like what skills you need right now, I, you know, my first uh, reaction was like, Jesus Maria, I have no idea like what people need uh, in this crazy COVID nonsense. Uh, so at first I was kind of shocked. And uh, then I thought about it. I was like, okay, you know, obviously we need some kind of sense of direction. And, and I have some ideas about what lawyers should be doing in general and skills that they should be picking up and resources and all that stuff. Uh, and so I want to share that with all of you. At, at the same time, what I would like to do with the, today's session is I get you guys to share your ideas about you know what type of skills are going to be relevant uh, or even ask questions about this because it's boring as hell to hear my voice uh, the whole time during these sessions. So the, as Christoph mentioned, I'm going to try to make this interactive and uh, let's just start stuff off and, and, and see how this works out. Now, I have to share my PowerPoint slides. And Christoph, I can see your face. Uh, can you see this uh, PowerPoint presentation being shared right now? Yes. All right. And, and one thing I got to check. Uh, all right. Great. All right. So we're starting up now. And uh, I have this idea that uh, we need to figure out what type of skills that, you know, if you're going to be trying to survive in the next year, two years, whatever many years that uh, we're going to go through with this stuff, uh, you know, we need to figure out like what skills uh, are going to you know put you in a better position, whether to advance you in your current career, you know, switch to another role, whether you're going to in-house uh, to a law firm doing something else, you know, what type of th types of things are going to be valuable for us uh, in the coming years? And to begin with, uh, let's go down, I guess. No. I'm having troubles now. All right, so the biggest challenge. What I wanted to do at the beginning now is that uh, instead of me telling you what I think you should be doing, uh, what we first need to focus on is what are the big challenges that we're going to be facing in the next years? And instead of uh, us talking about oh, COVID or quarantine, which we all know about, uh, let's talk about you, know, you as a lawyer or even a law student now, what do you think is going to be really important in terms of uh, the challenges for our profession uh, in the next six months, one year, you know, whatever you have, please do me the following favor. Go to the chat box. You can find it somewhere at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you look, uh, it's probably in the more with the three dots. And if you go to the chat box and just write into the chat box, uh, you know, with a couple words, what you think are going to be uh, the challenges that we're going to face soon. Please help me out and share your thoughts on this. What types of challenges are we going to be facing soon? So we got one response so far. So Jofia says, uh, very nice. Okay, being persuasive online. Cool. Now, there's some other people. Opportunity to work in a good position. And David says it with a question mark. That's nice. Uh, Andras is blaming tons of new legislation and regulation. Janos is talking about the digital world. Now we start to get people warming up. Okay, getting real world, real work experience as a student, uh, that's valid as well. Uh, Laventa, have up-to-date knowledge. 
Ana Maria is very straight to the point. Okay, finding payable clients. And then uh, Thomas uh, is talking about to feel myself well when I'm at home all of the day. That's... Thomas, can you turn your mic on, please? Because I'm interested. Uh... Yes, of course. Hi. So, hey, man, you know, I wasn't going to go down this road, but I completely agree with you. That, you, know, you know, so why did that come up for you? It's, it's really accurate. Uh, but, you know, why, why did this uh, come up as a major challenge for you? Yeah, because... Uh... You know, it's like a quarantine, like the COVID situation. Uh huh. Uh, in my uh, university, uh, we switched the the learning system to online. Mm -hmm. We are at home uh, right now, uh -huh. and we have tests and all of things as an online platforms. You know. Yeah, and, and it's difficult, right? To yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> imagine that without the the community, without mates, and so on. Like uh -huh. The feelings. Yeah, I, I, I can't even imagine going back to law school and going through this stuff right now. So one thing for Tomas and uh, for everyone, you know, I, I wasn't going to go too much in, into this, uh, but uh, Tomas, there's a really cool course uh, you can find online. It's free. Uh, and I, I took it because it's really awesome. Uh, it's from Yale. And uh, it's about uh, it's about like happiness. I think, or, or positive mentality or whatever. It's the most positive class at Yale, even pre-COVID. And it's, uh, the, the reason it's so valuable is that like in the Ivy League, I was there as well, like half the students are on antidepressants. It's always extremely stressful and depressing. And like, being under COVID is the same way. And one thing I would recommend for those of you that are struggling, you know, being at home all the time and getting depressed with this stuff, which is completely normal. I'm going through the same shit. Uh, check out this course. And, and at the end, if I forget to bring it up, uh, I'll, I'll send an email around to uh, the R.S. Pony people. They can share it with you guys. Uh, I, I have to look it up. But, uh, but thank you, for Thomas, because that's a really valid thing that you, that you mentioned. And I appreciate you uh, starting this off with that. Jofia Varconi, can you, can you jump on for a second, please? Yes. All yes. right. Hey, hey, Jofia. So, you know, you hey. were the first one to respond. So I, I really like that. Uh, so <laughs> you're talking about being persuasive online. Why does that come off uh, as being important to you? Like for me, it's important because uh, exams are coming and most of my exams are going to be held online. Oh, so yeah. I feel that I have to put extra effort into being persuasive, that I, ha I have prepared very well, that uh, I am not cheating. <laughs> and what I'm telling to the teacher is my true knowledge. It, they're putting the, 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 the exams now are going to be like via Zoom or Teams or whatever, uh, but it's exactly. oral exams online? Yes. Oh yes. God, like, uh, that's rough. Uh, one thing I can tell you, I sometimes teach, uh, like, uh, speaking courses online. And one thing I would recommend, uh, and it's not about like how you're speaking itself, uh, but like kind of the atmosphere you're making with the setup for when you're speaking, uh, ju just, uh, some recommendations, uh, Jofia is that one thing is like a lot of people are working from their laptops, you know, like, uh, I don't know how, how you're, uh, communicating but i assume you're probably using a laptop yes. yeah yes right. and one thing is like when you're when you're talking into the laptop and you're looking down it's kind of a bad uh, vibe a bad uh, feeling to, to speak to people that way so one thing i tell my students for like public speaking on zoom or whatever is to take some books and lift your camera up uh so it's kind of like eye level mm -hmm. because uh that creates a better uh feeling with the the people you're speaking to uh two other things is uh you know make sure when you're when you're talking to your professors if you can uh, stare into the camera like I'm doing now, because usually we're staring yeah. off of the boxes on the side and that actually, that hurts your persuasiveness because it makes it kind of weird that like, why isn't she looking at me? And the third thing is uh, get yourself some kind of lighting uh, for your face because uh, actually like when you have bad lighting up, it makes you look kind of suspicious or whatever. Like this, this is what I read about. Uh, Thank you about. very much. I hope it will work for me as well. Uh, if, if not, don't blame me. <laughs> I don't have any control. <laughs> thank you. This. All right. Thank you. And last person, Andras, uh, you're talking about tons of new legislation regulation. Yeah, I think uh, just very basically um, if I just think of my, my, my uh, narrower field energy, we have uh, we have legislation following uh, actually the the development of of the real world or technology mm -hmm. like now there's regulation for for um, filling electricity filling stations energy storage uh, but but you can or or self driving cars which mm -hmm. is sort of not 
that my, but, but what I mean is, is, is like we, we live in a changing world, which is even more, uh, how should I say, uh, speeded up by uh -huh. this COVID stuff. Um, or, or one can think of uh, online uh, tri uh, tribunal sessions, arbitration, uh, and, uh, and uh, the judiciary has gone online to some extent. So, and, and each and every piece of that is, is regulated again in more and more detail. All right. So what skill do you recommend for young lawyers? Uh, Reading. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Andras. Uh, I appreciate it. So now let me give you my challenge. Uh, and it's I took the easy, safe way out. Uh, my answer is this, that uh, everything is so freaking uncertain right now that, you know, it's extremely hard to plan and guess and tell you like, oh, you need to do this or you need to do that because things are changing so much. Like who thought that I was going to be talking to you in a bunch of boxes like a couple months ago? This, this is all crazy. And it's really difficult for everyone, for the firms, for the law students, uh, for the in-house people, everyone. It's like, okay, what's going on from day to day? And when we get out of this, what's going to happen? So that doesn't mean that you can't plan uh, in a smart way to pick up skills, uh, but you need to recognize that if things are uncertain, you need to use a different approach than what we've been doing. You know, I would think for many of us that have been in this profession a long time, you know, like for the last at least 10 years, we've been going down the same road. And the thing is that uh, obviously something has changed dramatically in this road. And if you keep going the same way that we've all been going, you're just going to run into a wall because it's inevitable that things are going to change and we need to prepare for that. So let me talk about what I'm going to get into today. Oh, having problems with these slides. Okay. So what's in it for you? There's three things I want to talk about. The first is I think that we all need to figure out a new game plan for whatever you're doing for, for me with my training, you know, for Andras doing in-house stuff for the law students that are preparing to jump into their new careers. Uh, uh, we need to recognize like what people have been telling us for the last 10 years or whatever you like for a long time now, maybe it's not relevant for what's coming up and we need to kind of be more, uh, uh, flexible in our thinking and trying to find a different way of doing things and doing it in a smart way. So I'm going to give you some ideas of how I would look for a new game plan if I were you. A second thing that I would tell you is this, is that, you know, I love you guys, uh, you Hungarian lawyers, uh, you're really smart, uh, you're really hardworking, and I think you're too hardworking. And actually all lawyers are too hardworking. And what I mean by that is that there are plenty of skills that we can pick up as lawyers that don't take much time or effort and they're extremely valuable, but we tend to ignore them. And so I'm going to give you an example of one today, but one of the things I, I strongly encourage you to do is that whatever new skills you want to pick up, don't invest too much effort or time into it because once again, what's coming up next is quite uncertain. So you need to be flexible and not overcommit yourself to anything. The third thing that I think you should think about is also uh, check out what I call risky skills. And what I mean by that is that over the years, I've told many of my friends who are lawyers, both here, back in the States, wherever, you know, like it would be a good idea if you did this or good idea if you did that. And, and they're always like, oh, but, you know, that's risky or that's uh, we don't do things this way. And I got it, you know, like as lawyers, we're extremely risk averse and uh, we don't like to, you know take on risks. The problem is a lot of times uh, these risks are not really risky. It's just that we're lawyers and we're paranoid about everything. So one thing I'm going to encourage you to do is look at new potential skills uh, that you might feel risky, but uh, maybe the reward is going to be worth it. And I'll give you an example uh, when we get to that part of today's presentation. So let me go down now. All right. So first of all, I've got something obnoxious on the screen. Uh, this is uh, the Friday team. And uh, I'm not a huge Friday fan. So, you know, the Uish Pesh people don't have to get mad at me. I don't really care that much about the uh, Fozzi. But I think this example is quite relevant uh, and something we can all understand. When Friday is going to play Uish Pesh, Doja, I don't know what are all the teams in Hungary, but uh, when they're going to play other teams in uh, MN Bay, Edge, they're probably following a pretty familiar or similar strategy. Like I know that we can get into the finite parts of uh, Fultzi and say like, okay, they're doing this differently, doing that. But most of the time, if you look at it globally, they're 
they're following a pretty similar game plan or strategy most of the time. But when all of a sudden someone decides to put Barcelona on their schedule with Lionel Messi, you know, this is like a once in a lifetime thing, just like COVID is probably a once in a lifetime thing. And if Fraudy follows the same strategy, the same game plan that they do against Uy Pest, uh, against Barcelona, you know, it probably doesn't work out well. And so if they were smart, they were probably talking to other teams about like, uh, how do you play Barcelona? And the same thing for you guys is that you probably want to try to find some other game plans uh, if you want to deal with this once in a lifetime COVID stuff. So let me give you the starting point I think you should all check out. This is called the ACC Value Challenge. Most of you have no idea what the ACC is, so let me tell you. The ACC is the Association of Corporate Counsel. It's like the American Bar Association, the Budapest Bar Association. It's an organization, uh, but it's not just for uh, accreditation. They also provide materials, resources for corporate counsel around the world. And the value challenge is something that was created back in 2008, 2009, when we had our last major recession. And one of the things I think is going on right now is besides this COVID stuff, we're going to have a massive recession. And it would be good to go look back at you know, what people were doing that was smart in the previous recession. And that's what this value challenge is all about. Basically, what happened back in 2008, 2009 is that the managements of companies said, look, we're running out of money. We need to cut costs in our companies. And we're looking at you, legal department. Uh, you guys are not making us any money. And you need to, uh, one, cut uh, your expenses. And two, you need to prove to us that you're actually adding value to the company, which, as you can imagine, wasn't really comfortable for the in-house people. And in response to this, the ACC, they put together a website and a set of materials to help legal departments succeed in a recession, in a really crappy economy, just like what's coming at us right now. And if you take a look at their website, and let me show this to you, because it's uh, I think you'll find it interesting, hopefully. Just a second. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's see. Who do we have? Borbala, you're the only face I can see. It looks like you're sleeping, but uh, get, am I screen sharing the uh, this website right now, the ACC Value Challenge? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so thanks, uh, whoever. No, Domash. Okay, thanks, everyone. So the ACC Value Challenge, uh, what it is, it's like a bunch of resources, like the ACC Guide to Process Improvement, How to Map a Business Process, the ACC Guide to How to Make Value-Based Fees. For those of you that are in law school and you're like, what the hell is this all about? Uh, this is kind of like what law firms and legal departments are arguing about all the time. For example, you know, how to have the right type of fee arrangements and how to have the right level of fees. Other things, value-based staffing, you know, legal departments, how are you going to you know, find the right people for your team? The Guide to Project Management. All right, uh, how do we do the scope and all the stuff that we should be doing both for in-house and for law firms. And if you go on and on, there's plenty of materials, but let me go back to the presentation now and explain it in a little bit more detail. There are three sets of skills that the ACC proposes that I think if you don't know these skills, you should jump on them now and start to study them. I don't know them very well, but I understand their values. So let me explain them. First, we have project management. You know, if you don't have project management skills, and I don't care if you're working in-house and you have people that are responsible for project management, if you don't know this stuff, this is about how to set up a matter, how to do it efficiently, how to make sure everyone that uh, should be taken care of and everyone's voice should be listened to, and how to communicate it properly and do it efficiently and make sure that the scope is right and the fees are right. And at the end of the matter, even we're going to follow up and find out what we did right and better so we can do things even better next time. That's, you know, in a nutshell, what project management is. And that's something of extreme value right now at law firms and in 
for the in-house. That is something I would learn if I was going back and uh, being in your shoes. Another thing is knowledge management, which is just about, you know, how do we collect all the important data and information going on in the firm and even best practices, like what's been going on at our company or at a law firm that's been going really well. Because especially for you law students, once you get into the real world, you're going to realize that there's a lot of really useful information that's just kind of floating around in people's heads that uh, isn't being collected proper, properly. And it would be useful for companies to have this, especially when they're getting pushed down in terms of proving their value. The third thing is process improvement. And for those of you that have never seen process mapping and all this stuff, uh, process improvement in a nutshell is you can take anything like a transaction or you know some project in your company and you break it down into individual steps. You, you just map it out. And you even say who does what, and for particular steps, if there's like a, a template, you attach it to it, uh, you figure out how long that step is. And then you go back and to improve the process, you say, well, this step is stupid because we don't need this. You cut that out or this step uh, we can do faster and you make that faster. And it's a way of doing things more efficiently to improve your value in the eyes of the business people. Now, if any of that stuff interests you, then this is my recommendation. Recommendation. Just check out some free courses on this. And I put some examples here. One is from the University of Virginia, which is an excellent school. It's uh, the fundamentals of project planning and management. You know, that's about project management. Go check that out. You don't have to watch the whole thing because you might get sick of it, but take a look for an hour or two and decide if you want to learn project management. The same thing with, you know, if you want to get into process improvement, which I think is cool, then go to Warden Business School which is an Ivy League business school. It's really good. And uh, check out their Introduction to Operations Management. I think that's another good course. And all these are free. So you can check that out on your own. Now, just one thing. Let me go down. For some of you, you're probably saying this stuff is boring. Yeah. Especially you folks at law firms or that want to go work at law firms, you're like, oh, I don't want to do, do this stuff. This stuff sounds terrible. So let me tell a story that maybe will get you a little bit excited. This firm, Safarth, it used to be called Safarth Shaw. It was existing in Chicago when I worked there. Now, Safarth Shaw, back in like the early 2000s, it was a second tier firm, which mean, meant that the firm I worked for, Jenner and Block, we looked down on Safarth. We were like, okay, these guys are losers. And Safarth did something really smart. They went and talked to some business consultants from McKinsey, and they asked them that, you know, how can we make ourselves competitive with the first tier firms? And what the consultant said is like, look, you know, why don't you do something that businesses really want uh, that's going to help you win work? And that is, why don't you introduce process mapping in your firm? And so Safarth, what they did is they took most of the common transactions and matters they did in their firm, and they broke them all into process maps, which as a lawyer, that sounds like really crazy because transactions are so complicated, but they just broke it down into the common steps that they were following in every transaction. And, they, you know, they did a really good job of analyzing, okay, what is required for this, what we can get rid of. And one thing it did is that when clients started to push down on fees, Safarth could always outbid other firms because they were more efficient. They knew what they were doing. But what was even more valuable, and this is something that I think law firms in Hungary need to think about, is when Safarth went into the RFP pitches and, compete, and competed against like other law firms, uh, what they could do is that uh, the other law firms did the standard nonsense where they came in and they put a PowerPoint presentation about their firm and like the biographies, all of their great lawyers and how smart they are. And Safar said, like, nobody cares about that stuff. We're not going to bother you th with this. And what they put on the, the projector are the process maps they made for their transaction. And they said, dear client, this is what's going to happen. This is the first step. This is the next step. Uh, would you like to do this step? If yes, or we'll delete it for you. What do you want? And they just walked through the whole transaction with the client. And they said, okay, based on what we've discussed, the transaction is going to take this long and it's going to cost you this much. And of course, they started winning tons of work from law firms. In fact, Safarth became so successful, they created a consulting arm where they teach law firms how to use process mapping at their own firms. So for you lawyers that are like, this is boring stuff. And, and for me, you know, it feels kind of boring sometimes too. This is something you really need to check out. Uh, and that's uh, my little sales about process mapping. Now, one more thing. 
If you're trying to figure out a good business plan, another resource I recommend you check out is uh, Altman Weil. And Altman Weil is a consulting company in the States, and they work with law firms and legal departments. And every year they do a survey of law firms and they do a survey of in-house. And every year they show that a couple firms, a couple in-house departments are doing these smart process uh, oriented stuff and they're getting huge results and everyone else uh, is not and uh, it's looking stupid. They're also showing that every year law firms think they're doing a good job in the eyes of the clients, but the in-house surveys say they're not. And I just want to show you one example from the survey so you get to see like uh, kind of the value of their insights. So let me pull up. And Tomash, can you give me a sense? Am I showing a reallocation of law department resources? Or can anyone tell yeah, me? Am I... Yeah. All right, cool. Thanks for the thumbs up, Andras, too. All right. So this is from the in-house survey for Altman Weil. And this is a survey, nothing in Europe. It's all like the biggest legal departments and biggest law firms in the States. And this is from their law department survey. And this one they made during post-COVID. The law firm one was started before COVID, so it's not so useful. But this is really useful because they ask a very honest question. And that question is, you know, if you plan to decrease your law department spend, that means if you're going to cut, you know, your department budget in the next 12 months, how are you going to reallocate your resources? And the first thing they talk about is that a lot of firms, they're going to focus on efficiency. That's what that whole project management stuff is about. This is something that, you know, is going to become even more valuable. The second thing they talk about is they're going to neg negotiate lower costs with outside counsel. What the hell does that mean for law firms? That means that you're going to get less money and you're going to have to be cheaper. And one way you could be cheaper and efficient is to get into more project management, get into more process mapping. So, you know, whether you like these topics enough or not, uh, they're back in our face and there's something that we need to address. So if you're working in-house, you're working uh, for law firms or you're thinking about it, you know, go take a class on this stuff. And I think uh, you're going to see that it's going to make you interesting to employers. Now, Let's get back to the PowerPoint slide. All right, so now we got uh, Bill Gates here. And I, I like this quote from Bill Gates. He says, uh, I choose a lazy person to do a hard job because a lazy person will find an easy way to do it. All right, so what does that mean in this respect? I really think, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, that it's... It's nice that uh, everyone in Hungary is like really wants to study and go back to school. You know, I come up from a family of teachers and I value people getting diplomas and stuff. Uh, it's, I think it's great. But the thing is this, is that there's plenty of skills that, I, that you can pick up that you don't need to spend years in school to do this. And I also think because everyone is getting all these extra diplomas nowadays, it's like it, it's reduced the value of this. Back when I first came here in 2001 to go get an LLM somewhere like that was cool and amazing and, and revolutionary. Nowadays, it's becoming so common that uh, it doesn't really set you apart. And if that's the reason you're going to get all these extra diplomas, you should recognize uh, the struggle it's causing. Another thing you can do is just be lazy and find skills that are easy that, you know, sh lawyers should be doing, but they don't but they're important to clients, to business people. And let me give you an example of one. I have here on the screen a question, and that is when you're providing advice to a business person, you know, where should you put the main message of your advice? Should it be at the beginning, the middle, or the ending? And please uh, let me know your answer by going to the, the chat box and throwing it in the chat. So what do you think? Should we put the message at the beginning, the middle, or the ending? So Andras Sabo is going with uh, the beginning. Andras is quick. Everyone else fell asleep. Now, Thomas says beginning and ending. Of course, Zoe says ending. Jophia says middle or ending. Ana Maria says ending. Olga goes with ending. Yeki says beginning. Andras says beginning. George goes with ending. AV goes with ending as well. All right, so we got a lot of mixed uh, responses. So let's let's start with uh, Zoe. Can you hear me? 
Can you turn on your mic, please? Or is it unfair to call on you? All right, then I'll pass on you, Zoe. Anna Maria Butch, can you uh, join the conversation and turn on your mic, please? Yes, I'm here. All right. Hey, Anna Maria, thanks for hey. jumping in. So question for you is uh, you think that the message goes well at the ending, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and why are you deciding that? Um, I heard um, somewhere um, that uh, it could be very effective when uh, we just um, say a, a sentence and, and say the main message uh, in the end. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's very important that it's, uh, you should, you should um, you know, um, say it in a very positive way mm -hmm. now because it's, uh, it's, it's go, it, it goes deeper in, in somebody's uh, mind or or. Yeah, it goes deeply. Yeah, and I think that's cool, Anna Maria. And I like the fact, you know, you should say it positively. And you're right in a sentence, uh, in English at least, uh, in Hungarian, obviously we know it's different, but like uh, what you put in the end, the main message, like uh, it gets uh, the hong shui, the stress there. Yeah. But do you, do, you do, the, do you do the same thing with like your emails or, or your advice or, you know, your papers? You, you put the message at the end there as well? Hmm. It's very, very different. It's, uh, it depends on the case or it depends on the message I would like to, to give to the other. So um, I, I just thinking about the middle as well. Uh -huh. <laughs> you're, you're being a lawyer now. You're going all over the place. You're, you're gonna, I'm just joking with you. You're going to cover all three. Now, Zo uh, Anna Maria, I'll, I'll save you from this uh, torture and tell you what I, what I tell my students. It, it, and think about this, uh, Anna Maria, you know, if, uh, if, a lawyer, uh, I don't know, have you had a lawyer before to advise you personally? No. All right. Uh, now, or have you been advised by an IT person or advised by an accountant or, you know, someone with some really complex skills? Uh, let me explain what's going on. Uh, you know, when, when we get advice uh, from a, a lawyer, uh, we actually really, really want to get the message at the beginning. And, and I'll give you plenty of reasons for that. Uh, but I think if we pulled all the in-house people in this session today, I, I'm not, I assume you're not in-house. Uh, if you are, then I'm making a fool of myself. But most people, most business people, they want the message at the beginning. They really hate to kind of get into the heavy details of, uh, you know, the legal thinking that, that lawyers put together. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my recommendation and like the one skill that I think it's like so undervalued for lawyers is that if you can get the message and stick it at the beginning, it's awesome, but it's extremely hard to do this Anna Maria. And it feels bad to do this. And let me explain why. One of the cool things uh, about the, the research of how lawyers write is that we use our thinking as, or our writing as our thinking process. And so oftentimes at the beginning of what we're writing, you know, the, we're thinking, uh, uh, we're not sure what the answer to the client's question is or, you know, the issue or whatever. And we kind of write it through. And at the end, we get to the answer and it feels good to leave it there because when we have to put the message or the answer at the beginning, it feels like we're changing our thinking and it feels really, really bad. But I can't imagine one business person on the planet that's going to say, Oh, you know, I would love to, you know, just wade through your thinking and, and I'll, and I'll patient. I'll wait for the answer at the end. Uh, clients hate that. Now, let me tell you, Anna Maria, the other reasons why this is important. Additional added benefits of message first. And really, this is one of the most important things when you're communicating uh, in writing as a lawyer to get the message before you get into the law, to get into the details. And the message is usually the answer. If you can get it up front, uh, people really appreciate it. But there's two additional benefits. One is that there's no yo-yo effect. And what I mean by that, Anna Maria, is that the way that uh, clients read legal advice, that they read it with their emotions. And this is how it, it feels to read uh, what a lawyer writes to us. Because, you know, usually the, the question the client has is like, okay, I got a really bad problem uh, and uh, I need to know, am I going to be okay? And they're probably doing something stupid. So, you know, it's not going to be easy to answer that. And so you start to write the answer to the client and you're like, okay, well, uh, according to Hungarian Act, blah, 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 actually, uh, no, you're not okay. It's really bad. And so this is the yo-yo going down. And then there's the next paragraph that says, like, however, 
uh, there's been some new legislation, uh, which seems not too bad for you. And then the yo-yo goes back up and then it's like, oh, but unfortunately the courts have been kind of weird recently and, uh, <laughs> they're interpreting things in strange ways. And you're like, so I don't know what's going on. And then at the very end on Maria, it's like, oh, but by the way, we think it's okay. <laughs> and the thing is this, if you just said, we think it's okay at the beginning and you didn't take the client on that up and down yo-yo thing, uh, it would feel awesome to them. It's really hard to feel this as lawyers because it's not our problem, right? Uh, but it feels terrible to clients. So that's one benefit. Other benefits I put at the other part of the slide is that it saves everyone time when you do this. You know, the clients, they don't have to get into the heavy details after your message. Uh, they don't have to read about the law and you don't really want them reading about the law because most of the time, uh, if they're not lawyers, especially they didn't go to law school, they don't want to learn this stuff. The second thing is if you're working for a supervisor anywhere, uh, the supervisor, you know, if they're smart and busy, uh, they don't have to get into the heavy details either. They just check if your answer looks good or not and they, and they skip it. And the last thing, which is important, Anna Maria, and for everyone, is if you make a nice, clear, good message at the beginning, do you really need to spend time making the heavy details afterwards, the perfect, you know, putting the right comma here and making everything super well in English? I don't think so. And I teach uh, legal writing, but I think it's a waste of time. If you can get the message at the beginning, I think uh, that's really what people are looking for. So that's just an example of easy skills that I would uh, just look out for. And there's plenty of uh, easy skills to pick up. And it, you know, that's, that's something that you don't have to spend too much time, commit too much effort in this kind of uncertain world. Now, thanks, Ana Maria. Now, let me get to the last thing I wanted to talk about, and then we'll get to you know, some uh, discussions. So the last thing I wanted to bring up is that there are plenty of skills that uh, typically lawyers stay away from because they say they're risky. I'll give you an example that I think uh, it just drives me crazy. Lawyers don't do this. I think whether you're working in-house or you're working at a law firm, you should be surveying your clients after you do you know, a matter or handle some kind of uh, relationship with them and figure out what they liked and what they would like to see in improvements. And I, I, I can't understand why lawyers don't do this. I understand why we feel uncomfortable asking for this feedback, but it's a great way to make your internal clients or your law firm clients happy and to also improve the relationship and improve the quality of your services. But, you know, that's for another day. Let me give you another set of skills uh, that at first for me were kind of uh, risky, but I think you'll find extremely beneficial in this kind of online world that we're living in. And the skill I want to talk about is just uh, how to have an interesting conversation online, because I think the biggest problem that people have when they're speaking online is that it's not a discussion. It's kind of a lecture. It's really easy when you're speaking on Zoom or Teams or whatever uh, that uh, just to fill in the, the silence, to keep talking, 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 talking. And that's a killer. That's why everyone gets so exhausted. So what I've consciously done ever since I started moving my training online, and this was about uh, October last year, is really trying to have conversations with my students because I saw that that got a lot of great feedback uh, in my surveys of my students. And let me give you kind of some inspiration behind this and why this is so cool. And it comes from this guy that's on the screen right now. His name is Phil Donahue. And Phil Donahue was a TV personality when I was a kid. And what Phil Donahue uh, did is he got, a, he, he got a chance to be on TV back in the 80s and to have his own uh, uh, interview show. And he was told by the studio, it was a small studio in somewhere in Ohio, and they said, look, we're going to give you this show but you need to get people to watch it because if they're not going to watch it, we can't sell advertising. And if we can't sell advertising, we're going to kick you off. So that was a nice little introduction to TV for film. Now, before Phil's show and after Phil's show, there were two slots and they were both nationally syndicated TV show slots. Back then, what it meant is that the TV shows were made in New York. They were high quality and they usually had some cool people. For example, you might have like a young Michael Jackson from the Jackson five or a fat old Elvis Presley or whatever. And they would be singing and everyone would be happy and clapping. And it was nice. And so Phil Donahue had to compete with these people. And so Phil's interviewing the local like pizza chef in his town and like really boring local personalities 
And one day during his show, someone in the audience stood up and started like yelling. And, and Phil said, okay, what's going on? And he, and he walked out of the audience and he took his microphone and he gave it to the person. And the person just had a question for the guest on stage. And then the guest on stage was talking back and it was like a really cool dynamic. And then other people in the audience had questions. And then Phil's running around the, the studio, like giving the mic to everyone. It, it, it turned into a, like uh, the audience show, not the Phil show. And Phil realized that uh, this is amazing television. This is an amazing interaction. And he changed television because prior to the Phil, the way that shows worked is that uh, it was like the zoo. The people on stage were the animals and the people in the audience were the guests and you don't interact with the animals. And in fact, uh, the cameras were between the people on stage and the people in the audience. And Phil said, that's dumb. Please take those cameras and get them out of here. Move them to the sides. Move them behind the audience because the audience is my show. And one thing that I recommend for all of you is if you're going to be doing your speaking online and maybe even for your tests, although I don't know if you can pull this with your test, but when you're having meetings online or even doing webinars, uh, you need to remember that the audience is the show and you got to bring them into the discussions. So I've been doing that today. And let me give you some... Uh, advice about how you can make your zoom sessions less painful is just quite simply it's boring as hell to sit in meeting after meeting so think about making these meetings a conversation and there's a couple techniques you can use that i think are useful one is you can use what i call two level questions which i did at the very beginning with all of you where i asked you to put in the chat box and answer to you know, what is the biggest challenge we face right now and then as the second level, I just picked you out of the chat box. I turned you to, told you to turn on your mic, and we had a nice little discussion. Other techniques, if you want to make your meetings a little bit more dynamic, uh, this is a weird one, but it uh, was told to me by a DLA partner in London, is that uh, they use like this app. It's called the Spin the Wheel app, and you can put the names of everyone in the meeting on the app, and like it spins, I guess, and it lands on someone, and they got to talk during the meeting. I think that's weird. The last thing you can do, and I was going to go this route, but I, I, you know, I'm going to run out of time, so I'm not going to do it today. But a third route that I like to use whenever possible is to use breakout rooms uh, during my meetings, during my trainings, uh, to allow, allow people to talk in small groups because people are more comfortable doing that and uh, they really find it valuable. Now, because you know I'm really running uh, up to our time limit for today, let me give you my summary and then we'll just jump into the Q&A. So this is what I want you not to forget in a nice image of Mayor Giuliani. So just remember, find a new game plan. Check out All Mid Wild for their awesome reports and check out the value challenge resources uh, for maybe some skills that will interest you. The second thing is for lazy skills, uh, you know, why do you need to start a 10-year LLL program? Uh, just start with your freaking message and your clients are going to love the way you write. The last thing is this, risky skills. Don't be afraid, especially during COVID times, to test risky new skills because uh, this is the perfect time to do it. And my favorite new skill is trying to have interesting conversations. Now, that's it for me today. So let's switch to Q&A. And if because there's still a lot of you in here, uh, please go to the chat box. And if you have questions, uh, please ask those there. And by the way, Ana Maria, as we're waiting for questions, you're absolutely right that you need to start with a positive opening message. Uh, and then the, however, so Ana Maria, can we get to your question as we're waiting for other people to ask questions? Or you didn't say a question, but uh, what did you mean about the, about the councils might not answer immediately? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm here. I'm just having some oh, okay. uh, problems here. And I turned my camera on as well. I don't know if you can uh, see me. And I'm so proud to be here because actually it's almost 9 a.m. I'm in New York. Yay, okay. <laughs> and it's my... And it's my pleasure to, um, uh, to participate in this call. And I was so excited all, all week uh, to, to listen to your, uh, to your presentation. Thank you so much. And I will have, um, I guess, some questions at the end. Uh -huh. But um, I'm here uh, for my MBA degree. Actually, I graduated in, in May. So I'm a COVID graduate here. Well, where did you <laughs> and, get your uh, MBA? 
in Niagara University, New York. Ah, cool. My mom's from Brooklyn, so I'm really happy you're in New York. All right, so tell oh. Tell me something Good. cool. Uh, so you're talking about the importance of it, it. We actually did a training earlier this week with Andras Nemeth, who, uh, who jumped in earlier. Don't disappear, Ana Maria. I, hopefully I didn't scare you off. But we talked about the that these positive uh, openings, beginnings are extremely important. I agree with you. And then you wrote this about the however the councils may not answer immediately. Who's, what do you mean by that? Well, we don't know. I mean, we might not know at the beginning uh, the the pr problem of the client uh, so we exactly. need some time to to think through what do we want to say how do we want to solve their problems and and i guess this is another skill that i would recommend all of you who are in this call to to practice creative problem solving and i can give you some recommendations as well it's it's a great great stuff and once i go back to hungary and i will continue practicing uh practicing law i'm sure that i would implement this process in my <laughs> everyday job but um what i wanted to say is that it's very important for the client to to come down at the really beginning that there is a solution for his or her uh -huh. problem but as a legal counselor i need to be responsible for myself as well and for my client so that i don't say anything at the beginning that might be that might not going to happen at the end or, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, of course. It, but but you're absolutely, the, like, I really like uh, the focus on the beginning message because I think, uh, you know, we're all trained in law school to see the negative side of things, right? Uh, to avoid the risks. And it oftentimes comes off in our, you know, I teach uh, a lot of writing courses and it comes off all the time that like we're putting these messages out and they sound so bad for a client because they're, they're focusing on the negative side of stuff and they don't want to hear like the problems. They just want to hear, okay, what should I do? Like what's going to work out for me? So I, I completely agree with you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, and that. that's, and that's part of the legal counseling as well to map up, to map out what is the problem? How can we solve it? What's the solution for that? And then we can go from there. Cool. All right. Thank you, Ana Maria. So is anyone else going to ask questions or are you just going to leave Ana Maria to, to talk from New York and uh, grab a bagel, hopefully? Any I don't eat bagel. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then uh, then if there's no questions, I'm going to stay around a bit, uh, but I am told that I am going to sell the next uh, awesome uh, session that's coming up after me. Uh, someone I really like, uh, it's Melinda Pelican. She's going to do a session on banking and finance. So, you know, please, uh, uh, yeah, banking and finance, a lot bond. Uh, so please uh, stick around for that because I think that's going to be cool. And we even have the Zoom link. You can find it in the chat box. Uh, so go ahead and uh, feel free to jump on into there. And for everyone, uh, thanks a lot for coming today. And uh, Kristoff and everyone uh, at Ars Pony, thank you guys uh, for putting together this awesome program. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Jofia. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> hey, Aaron, can I ask another question, if you yeah, don't mind? No, I'm not going, so go ahead. Tell me something. Okay, good. thank you. <laughs> thank you. And, I, and I was put, just put it away. You got it, but you have to promise to put in the chat your the problem solving uh ideas uh or links. Or send it to oh, yeah. uh Christoph, I guess. Okay, absolutely. I can I can send it to him as well. Actually, there's a book which we use in, in my creative problem solving class. It's a, uh it's called Think Wrong, and it walks you through six <laughs> different processes and steps. Uh, from ideating to design thinking and it's it's awesome i love it <laughs> uh, that's the lucky thing about doing the mba you know they have some really good uh resources for like whatever these methodologies for analyzing stuff so i i love uh seeing those all right so what's your question Anna maria yeah so my question i don't really know too much about your personal um background or mm -hmm. prof professional history but it's very interesting for me to see now here from the U.S. that you are there in Hungary <laughs> from the U.S. <laughs> so did you have any challenges at the beginning when you when you landed what? to Hungary or what was the reason why you ended up being there and how did you yeah, okay. overcome, you know, all this cultural stuff that's going on? <laughs> yeah, I know. It, I'll tell you my story. So I came here in uh, 2001. I started off in Chicago as a lawyer at this place called Jenner and Block um, uh, in I actually, I never really wanted to be a lawyer, but I think, you know, American culture enough now that if you don't want to um, uh, work after college, uh, you go to law school. Have you noticed that? 
No, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 the American trick. Uh, you can't go to business school yet. You got to work for a bit. Uh, but if you don't want to, if you want to avoid the real world, then you go to law school. So I did my law school time and I got a really good job in Chicago. They, they threw money at you. You see the law firms in the States, they, they kind of overcompensate people. And then, you know, I did that for a couple of years, but it was really just awful. It was like nights and weekends constantly with billable requirements. And I just decided like, look, I don't want to be a lawyer anymore. And uh, I had done studies in, in Europe before and I'd actually been hungry a couple of times. I was like, you know what? I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to go, you know, travel around Eastern Europe, do the typical uh, stuff like that. And I came to Hungary. I studied modern uh, Yelvishkolaban, Tanotam. I did all that stuff. And, uh, and then I got a job at Baker McKenzie working at uh, Martonia Skytar. And I was doing uh, not the legal stuff. I was more like lector and trainer and all this other stuff. And that's how I got into the stuff. But it's it wasn't that uh, difficult or complicated. You know, it's just a different culture. But uh, that's it. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. So now you are um, um, you are not practicing law, but you are no, no, training. I and yeah, yeah, yeah. So so what I do now is like I have training stuff. Uh, Primarily, I work with lawyers on uh, like written skills, like uh, how to communicate clearly to clients, uh, effective writing, how to put the message at the beginning. I do like con contract drafting courses because nobody actually teaches that in law school. And then I also do like uh, some more like uh, oral communication. So like negotiation skills. I have a couple of courses and I'm doing presentation uh, now, basically how to do Zoom presentations. So you don't make people fall asleep. So that's, that's my, my angle. <laughs> oh, that's, that's very interesting. And I'm, I'm so glad that you find a way in, uh, in Hungary. Oh, yeah, <laughs> if I, if I go home, I'll definitely connect you. <laughs> oh, that's cool. And yourself, yeah. how did you get the Niagara? But you were studying in Niagara or the schools in New York city? No, no, it's not in New York city. It's up, it's up at, by the border. Uh, so upstate? Canada is, You're yeah, upstate? so it's Western New York. <laughs> Very <laughs> cold here now. <laughs> um, I, I, I went was... to college in New Hampshire, so I know what you're going through. It's uh, it is yes. cold, but it's much colder there than uh, on the like the more on the coast. It's not as bad, but inland, I'm from Iowa, so it's extremely cold. It's terrible. Every everyone, yeah, by so the, the way, is still, is still watching, so they can enjoy our conversation. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's fine. They're, I guess they're bored. So anyway, keep going. Well, I, um, I was working in a law firm in, in Hungary and I was ready to start my bar exams when I, uh, when I realized that I need something else and I wanted to, to study something anyways. And I got this great opportunity to come here to the US and study MBA. Mm -hmm. So I finished my bar exams and a week later I took a flight. And uh, since then, I'm here. <laughs> Can you so. do me a favor since people are still around? And, and one of the things I wanted to recommend is like, besides that project management stuff, like another option is just to learn the business skills, because I think you recognize the value of that uh, for analyst people. So are there particular classes that you found uh, extremely useful? Because they can take a lot of those classes for free online. It's not the same as going to business school, but are there particular topics that you think are useful uh, uh, for lawyers that, that you um. were surprised by? Yes, well, I guess data and analytics, that's something very, very valuable. And you already mentioned it. Um, mm -hmm. Creative problem solving, like I said, public speaking, very important. And nobody is teaching that in Hungary, in none of the universities, uh, rhetoric skills. And uh, there is actually a really good um, rhetoric school as well in, uh, in Hungary. And, and the guy who is, um, who is the CEO or um, who leads it, um, he came to, to Yale University a couple of years ago and He's a super smart uh, guy. So that's what I, I would definitely um, um, look for if I was in Hungary now. And uh, some of the technical skills as well. I mean, just because we are lawyers, it doesn't mean that we don't, that we, we don't have to deal with quantitative data or data management or, you know, <laughs> this, um, this, this sort of, stuff <laughs> it was it were the the so you had to use some like do some mathematics then obviously for the the data and statistics right or yes i had to i had quite a tough course on that <laughs> but you found it because i i have other friends uh, that are lawyers from hungary that did mbas and they said like uh that financial data stuff like uh is really you know invaluable to understand like what's going on in the companies so like uh Well, you might not use it directly in your in your company, but it gives you um, but it gives you a different mindset, and mm -hmm. you can see things um, from a different perspective. And I guess that's something which is important. Yeah, I, 
I agree. It, one thing is like, uh, where did I, I was going to share like uh, another website with people today, but I forgot to. Do you know this? Uh, so are you mostly doing in-house stuff then? Anna Maria, were you an um, in-house lawyer or you were doing uh, uh, you were a law firm lawyer or doing like your own out external stuff? Uh, well, I, currently I'm not working as a lawyer. I kind of have a legal um, type of job uh, here, mm -hmm. but um, uh, but I did stop practicing law when I uh, uh, when I came here to the U.S. Mm -hmm. No, but the goal I, is to go back <laughs> to Hungary. <laughs> got it. Yeah, I, I think at least you're not in uh, New York or in, in Manhattan right now. That would be awful. So yeah. just one last thing I wanted to share with you and like everyone else, like, uh, you know, because I know some of the people that uh, are, are planning to go in-house or are, are in-house, or but even if you're not in-house, like one of the things that drives me crazy is that the lawyers, the law firms, they don't understand the thinking of uh, the business side and especially the in-house people. And there's this website here. It's called uh, legalleadership.co.uk. And this is actually, it, put, it was put together by, a, or sponsored by a British law firm, but it was put together by in-house people uh, in London. And it's an awesome resource of all the things that, you know, in-house people should know and all the skills they should pick up, including business schools, like business skills, like Anna Maria mentioned. So, you know, you might want to take a look at this uh, as another resource for building your own uh, skill set. Now we're running all the way to the end of the hour and I need to make sure that you guys go to, uh, to Melinda's course or Linda, Melinda's session. So thanks again, everyone for sticking around. I'm going to shut things down now.